Our opening hymn is hymn 37, hymn 37. the order of service as found on page 5. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we plead for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who hast given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, 
and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgiveth us all our sins. To them that believe on his name he giveth power to become the sons of God, and hath given and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Our psalm for today is the 14th psalm. It's found on page 852. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never learn? Those who devour my people as men eat bread and who do not call on the Lord. There they are, overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice in Israel and be glad. Glory be to the Father.
with your word so instruct our hearts that seeing you in Christ, your Son and our Redeemer, we may in all temptations and afflictions look only to you and at all times find comfort and deliverance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and governs with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. of Isaiah, the 35th chapter, beginning with the third verse. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling spring. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the great chapter on love. And I once heard someone summarize it by saying, it's a way of exposing our shortcomings and lack of love. It's a way of better understanding the love of Christ. And three, it can serve as a guide in terms of how we may be more loving in our conduct. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So far, the epistle lesson. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Hallelujah. gospel is written in the 18th chapter of St. Luke, beginning with the 31st verse. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, they will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. 
The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Here ends the gospel. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed is found on page 12. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with hymn 140. I realize it's a Lenten hymn, and Lent doesn't start till Wednesday, but I think it goes well with the material before us today. Hymn 140.
Grace be to you and peace from God our Savior. Amen. The text before us is from Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. This is our text. Dear fellow redeemed, if you're taking a trip, you make plans. There's a suitcase to pack, and in my case today, there are train tickets to buy and then a phone call or two to make sure that when I get to where the train lets me off, there's someone there to pick me up. My sister appreciates a certain baked good available in Chicago. And I do my best to make sure I get some of those raisin crisps for her on my layover in Chicago. And when COVID started, some of those places that sold it shut down and I was at a loss. And I'm sure the list of things we do to prepare gets even larger. According to the historic church calendar, today is the last of three Sundays of pre-Lent. During Epiphany, we look at the child of Bethlehem and scripture tells us he's not just our brother, he's true God as well as true man in one person. During Lent, we look at the work of Jesus Look at what he came to do and realize that his work led him to the cross. Pre-Lent, the season in between Epiphany and Lent, prepares us for our Lenten journey. And so, like taking a trip, we do well to prepare for our Lenten journey as well. If you're driving, you appreciate good roads. I'm not sure exactly when I heard it, but sometime in the last two weeks, after the snow and ice and some thawing, the newsman on the radio mentioned two locations where the potholes were so bad, he says, just find another route. And uh, those are things that don't make the journey all that pleasant. Our Lenten journey looks at the ugliness of sin. As our hymn just said, it also says our sin caused the death of Jesus as well. During the Lenten journey, we look at denial, betrayal, false accusations, and condemnation. Just as potholes are unpleasant, so also the Lenten journey may make us unpleasant at times as well. And so as we prepare for our Lenten journey, we do to re well to remind ourselves that sin is real, and that our Savior needed to go the way of the cross in order to be our Savior. And while at times the Lenten journey may make us uncomfortable, let us also remember that the Lenten journey ends on Easter. Roughly 2,000 years ago, in fact, it may not be that many years we'll be celebrating the 2,000th anniversary of the Good Friday and Easter. So roughly 2,000 years ago, Jesus was preparing his disciples to be apostles. At that point in time, Good Friday and Easter was still in the future. Jesus would soon finish his work. And he knew there were dark hours ahead for his disciples. So Jesus began to prepare his disciples for the rough road. Today we look at, according to Mark, Christ's second prediction of his passion. I find it interesting that Jesus was teaching his disciples in a private way. We note the word betrayed, and we also note the disciples did not understand. Our story takes place soon after the transfiguration. Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, came down from the transfiguration mountain 
And uh, to make a long story short, he healed the boy with an evil spirit. And then Mark writes, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. Jesus at this time was still attracting large crowds. But at this particular time, he did not want the people to know where he and his disciples were. I would say he wanted private time with the disciples because he was teaching them. There was much they needed to learn. And teaching goes better without distractions. When I study, I do not need to have the radio on and listen to MSU basketball. Granted, they might be good, good at listening, but I need to concentrate on what I'm doing. Granted, we need to eat and sleep and take care of, you know, those personal things that need to be done, but we also need to set aside time for study, study of the scriptures. And that study time goes much better when we're not distracted. Jesus would be understatement at this point to say he still had much to teach his disciples. By this time, the twelve had learned that Jesus was not just merely their brother, just not merely a mere man. The miracles that Jesus performed pointed to his divinity. It's one thing to recognize who he is, it's another thing to understand the work of Jesus and that they did not yet fully understand. When Jesus began to teach the 12 that he would be rejected, killed and rise again, in an earlier reference in Mark, Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked Jesus for talking that way. Jesus in turn had to correct Peter and told him that he did not have in mind the things of God. And what that story shows is that the twelve did not yet understand the work that Jesus came to do. The text before us is Mark's second mention of Christ predicting his death and resurrection. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus wanted, did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise again. Jesus clearly says that he will be killed. You and I have the benefit of seeing how Christ passion, his suffering and death unfolded in real time. You and I know that Jesus rose again. But at the point in our text, when Jesus told the twelve of upcoming events, what you and I know had not yet happened for those twelve. What is new here and what Jesus mentions is the word betrayal betrayed Jesus was telling the 12 that someone close to him would betray him note first that Jesus sees the future Jesus knew that suffering was coming for himself and yet he does not avoid the work he came to do you and I know that God's justice requires payment for sin. Jesus came to pay for sin and do it in our place. If you will, he's our That meant Jesus would die. But Jesus didn't run from the work, but willingly went the way of the cross for you and me. And keep in mind, secondly, that Judas was one of the twelve. Surely Judas had to hear the word betray. And I see in this that Jesus was already warning Judas before the event actually happened. Did later on that warning that Jesus gave haunt Judas? 
did J Judas think that in doing what he was going to do that because of the power that Jesus demonstrated somehow he would avoid being arrested? Was it greed that so blinded Judas that he only thought of financial gain? What Judas did reveals how sin corrupts mankind that applies to you and me as well as others. And while we may debate what Judas was thinking, what Judas did gives reason to look at the awfulness of how sin corrupts people, and it serves as a warning for you and me. And note third that Jesus said he would rise after three days. When I look at passages like this, I wonder if the twelve even heard these words rise after three days. Sometimes it seems to me that the twelve didn't get past the word suffer and die. Rise after three days, those words show that Jesus knew how the story would end. And for you and me, and ultimately for those twelve as well, minus Judas, the empty tomb of Easter assures us that Jesus won a victory for us, assures us that our sins are forgiven and that death has been defeated. Now, Jesus was preparing the disciples for the Lenten journey, but they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. It's simple. They didn't understand without the help of the Holy Spirit, you and I wouldn't understand any more than they did. So I don't think we need to be too hard on the disciples. Over time, the Holy Spirit has increased our understanding of the things of God. I learn things from the Bible today, and when I say, oh, that's a new thought, I'm going, I wish I had seen that many years ago. Meaning, my level of understanding still needs to go up. At this point, in the disciples' training, it's safe to say the twelve did not yet understand God's plan to rescue sinners. Now, that's, we're not setting aside the Old Testament here. Moses and the prophets pointed to the work of Christ. And Isaiah clearly talks about the coming Savior, the Messiah, as both a suffering servant and the Prince of Peace. Isaiah says regarding the Messiah that the Lord laid on him the sin of us all and by his stripes we are healed. But when you think of the picture of suffering servant and a prince ruling, it almost seems like they're contradictory pictures. And many Jews 2,000 years ago hung on to the idea of a ruling prince and just forgot about the suffering servant part of the picture. So the disciples did not yet understand, not at least at this point when Jesus was teaching them. And it appears on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, they were still didn't understand, and even on Easter, they were behind closed locked doors because they didn't yet understand. That's why Easter caught the disciples by surprise even though the Old Testament promised the resurrection you and I have the benefit of seeing those Old Testament promises fulfilled the disciples lived through that fulfillment and after God opened their, their minds they were then filled with joy it's a reminder that the natural man does not receive the things of God and so we prepare for another Lenten journey. As you look at the reality of sin, it makes us uncomfortable, and it should. But as we watch Jesus and see the love revealed by his willingness to suffer in our place, we are encouraged and strengthened and filled with joy. But they did not yet understand and what he meant and were afraid to ask him. 
I find their remark afraid to ask him about what he was saying interesting. And, and from what follows, it appears that instead of dealing with their questions and asking Jesus, they just simply changed the subject. The next paragraph reveals they were talking about who among the twelve was the greatest. And it may well be that at times our sinful nature wants to get us to change the subject rather than see what scripture is teaching us. changing the subject doesn't prepare us for the Lenten journey. Sin is real. And our Lenten journey will help us to confess our sin even more. And God's love and forgiveness are real as well. And so, as we travel on another Lenten journey, it will serve to increase our appreciation for the love demonstrated by Jesus and for the forgiveness of sins won for us by Jesus. May the Lord bless our Lenten journey. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all our understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. the first two verses. In 441, the first two verses. the suffering and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, you have brought life and immortality to light in this sin-darkened world. And we thank you for causing the light of salvation to shine in our hearts through the gospel. Open the eyes of our understanding that we never lose sight of the love with which you loved us, love that spared not your own Son, but delivered him up on the cross for us all. Grant that we may never reject your saving love nor despise your mercy which took pity on our lost condition. We must confess that we often sin and that we deserve only your wrath and punishment. But in your love and mercy pardon all our offenses for Jesus' sake. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that by humbling yourself and becoming obedient unto death for our sins, you have rescued lost sinners like us. We are comforted because you bore our guilt suffered our punishment, and died our death, and that for your sake God counts us righteous. All glory, honor, and praise to you, O blessed Redeemer. 
May the example of your love and of your devotion to our salvation stir up in us a desire to serve you all our days. O Holy Spirit, we thank you for calling us from darkness to light, from unbelief to faith, that we might be saved. Remember us in the weaknesses of our flesh and give us the spiritual gifts so necessary to overcome temptations and keep the faith. Put to naught all the cunning devices and schemes of Satan, the world, and our own contrary flesh, which continually attempt to lead us astray into the paths of sin and unbelief. Permit the joys of your salvation to dispel the sorrows of life. May we have no confidence in ourselves, but move us to trust alone in the righteousness of Christ for everlasting life. Keep us near the cross, filling us with a continual longing for the gospel, so that we diligently read it at home and hear it preached. Bring its precious promises to our remembrance and teach us to trust them, lest we deprive ourselves of any blessing you desire to give us. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is 396 in Christian worship. Hymn 396. I'm aware that not, it might not be a familiar tune, but I like the words.
grant, we beseech you, Almighty God, unto your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which comes down from above, that your word as becomes it may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and governs with you and the Holy Ghost, one true God, now and forever. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Closing him is 579. 